if you fell asleep and you're just now waking up, I don't know how much time elapsed during your nap, but you'll now see that something has happened, potentially, but maybe not. Maybe you didn't skip a beat, but I think I'm missing something here, and it's all because of Butterworth, wasn't it? I think before I had something written right here where I was talking about increasing the order in, and I said one of the results... would be a flatter passband, and the other characteristic of increasing the filter order in is to have a sharper transition into the stop band. Or a sharper transition from the passband to the stop band. Now, let's talk about how we might be able to, with a word problem, figure out the order in of our filter. How do we select in? And if you have the benefit of seeing the blackboard behind me, this is one of the first times that the blackboard actually has something relevant to this class on it. Typically, we'll walk in and you'll have words there that I should erase before we start class, typically. But here we have a signal. Let's say it's made up of two sinusoids, cosine omega 1t, cosine omega sub 2t. The first frequency, omega sub 1, let's say this is the frequency to pass or that we want to keep, and omega sub 2 is the frequency that we want to stop, or you might hear me say I want to attenuate, because we can't, with a sort of an on-off result, stop it completely, typically. We can only make it a little bit less, or we can cause it to be attenuated. Here's the word problem or part of it or at least the start of that. Suppose we want in XT we want the omega sub 2 component of X of T reduced let's say, to 5% of its original amplitude. And I'm not making this too messy or muddy by, I'm just making the original amplitude one. So that now if we want a 5% reduction, we really are effectively saying multiply that second component by 0.05 in absolute sense and keep the first component, cosine omega 1t, unaltered or as unaltered as possible. Yes? Yes, so now I said this, so the question was, don't we need to know the relationship between omega-1 and omega-2? And the answer is yes. In setting this problem up, I said this is the first piece of the word problem. What I'm suggesting in this piece is let's just knock down the second piece by 5% of where it is originally but I haven't said how far apart omega-1 and omega-2 sub are. That's going to influence the order, the little n. But for beginning this problem, let's just say that we want, in terms of attenuation, I'm wanting to, you to start getting comfortable with many of these different ways of measuring attenuation. A 5% reduction says, oh, just in absolute sense or a linear sense, multiply that cosine factor by 0.05.
or 26 dB, and let's see where that comes from. If we now have 20 times the log of 0 0.05, this is now the scaling that we are looking for. This is that 5% scaling that we wanted to accomplish. In terms of dB, if you're trying to build up a little bit better understanding of what dBs represent or how much different ones, if you didn't know that 5% represented 26 dB attenuation, where is that coming from? That's what I want to provide you with now. And you can think of this many different ways. One way might be, well, I know the log of powers of 10, and I know the log of integer values. Maybe I have that on my crib sheet. The log of 1, 0. The log of 2, log of 3. You write that down on your crib sheet, and then you know what it is, right? So in this case, what's the log of a product? Well, that's the same as the sum of those logs. Where this one is the easy one, and this is maybe what you could then get a rough scaling with, you know that the log of 10 is 1, right? And the log of 1 is 0. You know this is between 0 and 1 as far as a value is concerned. And if you've put this on your crib sheet, you know that the log of 5 is 0.7. It's 70% of the distance between 0 and 1 on a logarithmic scale. That's what that's telling you. So that now we have, if we take those two pieces, we could say this piece is going to give us 14 dB, and the other piece, which we could say is this piece and that combined, that's 20 times minus 2. I can actually do that product. That's now minus 40. And together, I just add those up, and there's my minus 26 dB. And hopefully that's starting to make some sense. For example, if you wanted a 10% reduction in your waveform or signal, that's now equivalent in dB of 20 log of 0 0.1. And the log of 0.1 is minus 1. So we know that we're, re we're on the right side of 10% with our 5%. 5% should be a bigger negative number in magnitude. I guess I should say a smaller negative number. It's minus 26. And if we said, well, are we in between? Is 5 in our Goldilocks spot? Let's look at 1%. This is now 20 times the log of 0 0.01, or that's 20 times the log of 10 to the minus 2, and I can use the exponent. I've now said that's minus 40 times the log of 10, or that's now minus 40 dB, and now it's seeming to be consistent. Yes? So you could think of a half being 6 dB down, in a sense. And then you have that added on to the, basically, the power of 10 that you were interested in, which gives you minus 20. Minus 20 and minus 6 gives you the minus 26 dB. That's another way and maybe easier to keep track of. Yes. Now, what we want to do is that's just the first half. We haven't said anything about omega sub 1. We want to find the filter order, and we say what low-pass filter is needed, or what order is needed,
if a reduction to a value of 5% at omega sub 2 is required and let's say for the first problem, let's just say for part A, what if omega sub 2 is 10 times omega 1? How do we refer to omega 1 and omega sub 2? Factor of 10, huh? <laughs> but what is a factor of 10? They're now separated by a decade. So you now say there's a decade of frequency between omega sub 1 and omega sub 2. Omega sub 2 is a decade higher than omega sub 1. And the reason we are interested in that information is because of this picture that we can now sketch. Here's omega sub 1 and here is omega sub 2. And we want this curve to be such that between these two locations, we now have 26 dB of attenuation. We need to be 26 dB down. Question? So now we didn't say that we wanted to have exactly 5%. Usually if somebody says you want 5% attenuation, you want that or more of attenuation. Usually you err on the side of giving more attenuation than less. And that's what's going to happen here because what do we know happens in a decade? If I said, well, let me just sort of walk through this process. If I picked a first order filter and I'm a decade away, I now have minus 20 dB down by omega sub 2. That's not going to be enough, is it? But if I now pick a second order, now I have each factor or each order giving me 20 dB. I now have 40 dB that's going to be less than minus 26 and that's what I have to live with. I have to over design because I don't have fractional filter orders, do I? I can't get a half a order of a filter. Maybe you can a, a drive-through window if you're ordering something. Give me a supersize this. That's maybe a fraction of the large. Maybe it's twice as large, but maybe it's not an integer amount. But we can't get fractional filter orders. We can only get a first order, a second order, a third order, so we have to, little n is always going to be an integer in our discussion where n represents the filter order. Are there questions on that? That one should be fairly straightforward. What about a second scenario? Suppose that we now relate the two frequencies by two. Now a factor of two represents an octave, doesn't it? Now we have a similar picture, except now, whoops, omega one and omega sub two are not as far apart meaning if we still need the same amount of attenuation, we want this distance to remain at minus 26 dB on this frequency axis. 
And what do we know about octaves? If somebody gave you a first order filter, how much are you going to be down by omega sub 2? That's our 6 dB, isn't it? 6 dB per octave. And we could expect that shouldn't be enough. We should be anticipating something bigger than 2, probably, or at least 2. Somebody's saying 5. Do I have a 6? Now we're in an auction format. So what do we have? Now you want n times minus 6. You get minus 6 dB for every order n, and you need that to be less than minus 26. We can now divide by minus 6, which says that n, the inequality needs to flip. We now say n is greater than minus 26 over 6, and that is now a little bit bigger than 4. And again, we can't have a fractional filter order, so we have to err on the side of an increased value of n, and now we have a fifth order filter. And you would probably build that with two quadratic sections and one real section to build that denominator polynomial for your fifth order filter. And if you were building up a Butterworth, you now know how those are arranged around your unit circle. What's the distance between those poles, angular spacing in those poles for a fifth order filter? If we now look at our formula, good thing I picked 5, right? Now I can divide 360 by 10, and that gives me then that these poles are separated by 36 degrees. Do I have a real pole? Does everyone know what I'm asking? These are quick answer questions that I could ask on exam three or the final that would show me your understanding of filters. Whenever you have an odd filter order, in this case it's five, you know you're going to have a real pole. You're going to have a pole on the real axis. And before you frequency scale it, it's going to be at minus one. Now you can measure 36 degrees from that and 36 degrees from that, and there are your four other poles in the complex left plane, half plane. Questions on that? I'm sorry? If omega sub 2 is 15, and what was omega 1? 1. So now what do we have? Now we have, what's their separation? <laughs> their separation now needs to be in decades or octaves, correct? So if you went up a decade, that would be two. Here's the reason maybe for thinking about octaves or decades. You could say this is bigger than a decade, isn't it? A decade would be 10, and two decades would be 100. So it's closer to one decade, but maybe you want to get closer than that, so you now do it with octaves. You say, well, how is it related in terms of octaves? Now, two oct or one octave would be two, two octaves four. Now I'm having to use my fingers and toes. What else do we now have? Three octaves would be eight. Four octaves would be 16. So now we need about four octaves, and that gets us much closer than one decade in terms of thinking about that. So that now we have four octaves of separation, roughly. We don't have that, so you might have to go back to the eight. 
but now you have four octaves and each of those gives you 6 dB per octave. So you roughly are getting 24 dB. How many did I say we had? Four octaves? So now we have 24 dB at about of attenuation by that point. Well, the comment was you're going to have, how do I, oh, what am I, what was I doing in terms of octave separation? Well, really, for a, a here's the other way of thinking of that, is you have four octaves, and each octave gives you 6 dB of attenuation. So if you just had a first order filter, in one octave you would be down minus 6, the next octave you would be minus 12, the next octave you would be minus 24, is that right? 18, can't subtract, and then the fourth is 6 beyond 18 minus 24. So now a first order filter will get you in a four octave span, it will get you down minus 24 dB. Does that make sense? So by the time you reach omega sub 2 equal to 16, you are down 24 dB with a first order filter. And that might get you better resolution or accuracy than saying, oh, in one decade, I'm down 20 dB. Then in the next decade, I'm down another 20 dB or I'm down to 40 dB by 100. So it wasn't that I was increasing my filter order, I was just seeing how many spans of octaves I have between omega 1 and omega sub 2. If that confuses you, try to think about the earlier discussion. Okay. So, what Another question that you might be asked on the homework is the following. Let's say that we now have, here's our omega axis, and maybe somebody says, here is what we want to pass, and maybe we want to be so far down, and maybe this is omega sub 2 and this is omega sub 1 meaning you may want your filter magnitude response to be such that it does something like that, that it falls outside of these constraint regions on a frequency axis. Now what you're going to maybe be asked on a homework is if you, so this would let's say be your break frequency, I think one of your homework problems is about just cascading similar filters. Meaning if I wanted if I said there's a filter you can sketch what that looks like. And maybe you've now built that. That's now one pole at s equal to minus one. And how far are you down at minus three? How far are you down at omega equal to one radian per second in dB? Pardon? So now, what's the break frequency for this factor? It's one, isn't it? So at omega equal to one, that's your break frequency. And how far down are you in real terms at the break frequency? With our straight line approximations, we're saying we're at zero, aren't we? That's where we meet. But in the real curve, it's 3 dB, isn't it, that we're down? Or this factor one over the square root of two in terms of an absolute number or a linear factor. Now the comment in your homework is, can I 
what if I did the following? What if I just introduced another factor? I just Am I just sort of overlaying the same picture on top of each other and not doing any more filtering? That's what the question is asking. And what's happening if you now look, and maybe what you want to do is quickly sort of think through what's going on here. The first one, maybe that's n equal to 1. What's n equal 2 look like? So this is now the n equal 1 case, and maybe we are interested in, does that change? If I just reproduce that same filtering behavior by cascading, do I just overlay on that same blue curve and the filtering is the same? It's not quite, is it? What's happening now to your Pardon? So now you're filtering the filter, aren't you? And really what you're doing is your, if this was 3dB, you're no longer, your 3dB point is not at the same position it was with one filter. Now your 3dB frequency is less. You're getting more filtering but now you're maybe sacrificing. If you keep this, if you don't frequency scale, now you have what? You have a steeper roll off into the stop band. Maybe that's what you want, but unless you change these numbers, you're going to be having a much slower or a narrower pass band. And that's what you need to be thinking about for your homework problem, or one of your homework problems. Let's talk about some other homework problems, which I think you're being asked about. And that is developing intuition in terms of these relative locations of poles and zeros. To do that, let's just think of a particular example where the particular example is a bandpass filter. If I said sketch the magnitude behavior or response of a bandpass filter, what sort of three lines could you draw to capture that behavior? Now everybody's, if everybody's watching, is that sort of band pass in behavior? Now, if this is the generic shape of the magnitude response in dB of a filter, of a band pass, what have we talked about? These frequencies here in the middle section are the frequencies we, we are favoring, aren't we? So what does that mean relative to what we've learned so far? What does it mean to say that we are favoring a given set of frequencies? Or how do we how do we put now we want to talk about poles and zeros? Does this tell us anything if I now labeled this axis with respect to frequency? And now I said, well, let's say that this is omega sub d. This, what does omega sub d tell us? Poles, zeros, nothing? 
pardon, it's shifting our frequency response behavior, but if I fix this at some value, let's say that it's 10. Omega sub d is 10. Now, is that consistent with my, no, let's say it's 5. So now omega sub d is 5. What does that tell us? Does that tell us anything about the poles or the zeros? If omega sub d is 5, Omega sub d is actually our damped frequency of something, and in particular, what do we need? If we want to favor something, we need to put poles at that frequency, meaning we now know the imaginary value of our poles, at least two of those. We know they need to be at omega sub d. Meaning, if we now went over to this next S-plane plot, we could say, oh, here's J omega sub D, and here's minus J omega sub D, and maybe we don't know where we want to locate those precisely. Maybe this distance, right now we will just call A, but we do know that value. That value is J5 and minus J5. What we have to figure out is maybe where A is. Now, that gives us an emphasis on these frequencies near omega sub D. What can we say about this piece of a magnitude Bode plot? What do we think is happening poles and zeros if we have this straight line coming up from low frequencies. What does that tell us? What gives us a positive slope in magnitude? Zeros. Those are upstairs, aren't they? They give us the positive slope. And now, if this is never breaking, what does that tell us about? So this is associated with zeros, this upward slope but do we know anything about their location? It's at the origin, isn't it? If it's never going to break and go up, it's always going down. This now tells us that this particular piece corresponds to a zero or zeros at the origin. And if we're just going to have a second order filter, maybe we just want one zero. So we have one zero. Now we have two poles. What does this tell us at the higher frequency region? If I said, what produces a negative slope at high frequencies, what would you tell me about the pole and zero relationship? Pardon? You have poles further away, but now is there any relationship between the quantity of poles or the quantity of zeros? If I'm going down, what does this, if, if I just erased all of this and said, oh, I have a sloping line that's going down, what would you, and maybe I tell you it's going down at 20 dB per decade, what would you tell me? You have one pole, don't you? If I now have this kind of a slope going down, I know I have at least one more pole than I have zero. If nobody tells me the slope, I know I have at least a pole bigger than the number of zeros that I have. This shape, then, tells us that we have more poles than zeros. And we have a fancy phrase for that, don't we? We could say that our transfer function was strictly proper, meaning we have at least one more pole than we have zeros. Because it, for high frequencies, 
we have a pole action versus a zero action, and a pole action gives us negative slope. All right, now what did we say? We said the center frequency we wanted to emphasize, and that gave us this picture of two poles. Then we said we needed at least one zero at the origin. Now, will this picture give us all that we need? Will this give us a bandpass filter? What's this give us? The zero at the origin, what's that give us? That gives us our slope up. Then what happens? Then we have two poles, don't we? So that's going to eventually give us more poles than zero. So yes, this is all we need. If we just wanted a simple bandpass filter, we could say we need two poles and a zero at the origin. And that will give us our bandpass filter. The flat region may not be very wide, but that's not what we were worried about so much. We wanted to emphasize maybe that central region around omega sub d. So let's now build a bandpass filter just out of this intuitive discussion. What do we know about our poles? We can create the pole factors, can't we? We have two pole factors. We have pole 1, let's say that's at minus a plus j5, which is the pole in quadrant 2. We have S sub 2, which is minus A minus J5. That's corresponding to the pole in quadrant 3. And now we can build this up. We can now take S minus S1 times S minus S2, and that's going to be our denominator expression because we want the denominator to vanish whenever s is equal to s1 or whenever s is equal to s2, and that will happen with this structure. And now we can plug in, s is our variable, but we can now plug in the particular values for s sub 1, and we have now s plus a minus j5, and we have s plus a plus j5 or the way that I like to play with it is let me just say that I now have s plus a squared plus 5 squared and that's now my denominator factor or expression and it's quadratic it's second order what do I know about my bandpass filter I know that I had a zero at the origin, and I have the denominator that I just derived, and maybe I don't know yet what my gain needs to be. Let me put a gamma in there, and I'll need to find what that gamma is. I have two unknowns right now in this bandpass filter. How do I maybe start eliminating some of those as unknowns? What if I said, you know what? I kind of like that Butterworth pattern, the Butterworth shape. If I want a Butterworth shape to, these, to this frequency response, what does that give me? What does that tell me in this parameterized form for H sub 1? If I said design me a second order Butterworth low-pass filter and the imaginary parts are plus and minus J5, what, where are the real parts? What do I know about a Butterworth that's second order? Do I have a real pole? Second order is even, so I don't. What's the angular separation between those poles? 360 divided by 2 times 2, 90 degrees. So now I have a 90 degree separation between these two poles in the left half plane. 
And I need to split that 90 degrees equally across that real axis. My angle is now 45 degrees relative to the negative real axis. And if my imaginary part is 5, my real part has to be 5 in magnitude. So if I want a Butterworth pole locations or pattern in this, let's say, bandpass filter that we're designing, then that's telling me what I can allow A to equal. And what does A represent? A tells me how much damping I have in my filter. That gets rid of one of those unknowns. What does gamma allow me to do? Gamma can be selected. That's the gain, isn't it? That's my adjustment of the gain. So I can pick gamma to give me a gain value where I want it. And where I might want it is right in the center of that passband region. Gamma can be selected to adjust the gain of the filter. Suppose we want the magnitude at that frequency of 5, that's the point of interest, that's h of j5, maybe we want that to equal 1. We want frequencies at 5 to be passed or scaled by 1 at 5 radians per second. That simply says that I replace s with j5 in my expression and I now have the magnitude of gamma times s but s is just j5 and then I have these two factors I have j5 plus 5 minus j5 its magnitude or length and then I have j5 plus 5 plus j5 that length where h of j5 is now, what's the magnitude of j5 gamma? You could put that on your shirt, couldn't you? j5 gamma. And you could say, yeah, that's the numerator of a bandpass filter. People would look at you like you were crazy, huh? But you would know what they were talking about. So now you have j5, what's the magnitude of j5 gamma? 5 gamma, the j has a magnitude of 1, doesn't it? So that's easy to find. Then the j5 minus j5 cancel, and I just have the magnitude of 5. And then the second term in the denominator, I have 5 plus j10. Those two 5s cancel, and now I have 5 over the hypotenuse of a right triangle with sides of 5 and 10. And I wanted that to equal 1. And now I can just set my gamma equal to that hypotenuse. Which is almost the square root of 121, which is 11. So this is a little bit more than 11. And now we've de designed a bandpass filter with Butterworth pole pattern. H sub 1 of S is now 11.18 S over S plus 5 squared plus 5 squared. What's the phase of this frequency or of this transfer function at high frequencies? Another short answer question. 
So now at high frequencies, what do I have? Minus 90, right? I have basically something that looks like 1 over S. And a pole will give me 90 degrees downstairs. That's my minus 90. Let's look at the other three filter types. And I could ask, what's the phase at low frequencies? Positive 90, right? I'm now coming in at 90 degrees. So I'm going to transition between plus 90 and minus 90, and that transition will occur around, in phase, omega equal to 5 radians per second. All right, let's talk now about what we can learn relative to poles and zeros about a low-pass filter. What do I know about the magnitude behavior of a low-pass filter? That's pretty easy, isn't it? That gives me that shape. What do I know this is doing? Whoops. This is saying I want to emphasize that region, isn't it? So this is now being favored. And what's this tell me? It's telling you that you have more poles than zeros, isn't it? You have high frequency roll off. This transfer function for a low pass filter has to be strictly proper. This is hints for homework. You now know that strictly proper corresponds to low pass and band pass. They have this high frequency roll off. You have to have more poles than zeros in a, high, in a low pass and a band pass. So this is now this low pass filter. is created by having a strictly proper transfer function. Let's now talk about a high pass. What's the magnitude response of a high pass look like? Something like that. What does this tell us? This portion tells us what? Now we're coming up from the bottom. This tells us we have zeros at the origin, doesn't it? So this says we have zero or zeros at the origin. What does this tell us? This now says, forget the strictly, now we're just proper. We have a proper transfer function. That says that the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, or the number of finite zeros is equal to the number of finite poles. Pardon? Now, if we have the same number of zeros as we have poles, what do we have in the high side of the polynomials? Maybe we have S over S, right? So now they're going to look like something that looks like a constant. Their phases are basically canceling each other out. Now, if you wanted to design a first order high pass filter, how would you build that up? If you wanted a first order high pass, 
First order tells you what? That tells you the number of poles, doesn't it? The order tells you how many poles you have. First says you have one pole. So let's just say this is a normalized. So I know I have that. But if this is the behavior of my frequency response, what do I have to put in there? A zero at the origin. That's now a high pass filter that has a cutoff frequency at one. What's happening at low frequencies? Well, the denominator looks like one, doesn't it? At low frequencies, and, and it's dominated by this S in the numerator. Then, at s equal to 1, this guy kicks in. I'm sorry, at s equal to j omega with omega equal to 1. Now this kicks in, and now we were coming up at 20 dB per decade. Now we flatten off, and we just stay flat for high frequencies. Frequencies beyond omega equal to 1. What if I wanted a second order? High pass. With Butterworth pole pattern. And let's just say that it's normalized to a bandwidth of one radian per second. If it's second order, I know that I need an S squared downstairs, and I need the same number of poles as I have zeros, and I need zeros at the origin. So let me just put two zeros at the origin. That will give me my line coming up from the left, low frequencies up. And now I want to roll that off with complex poles, two of them, and I want those to have a distance away from the origin of one, which is going to really give me that one there, one squared. But I now know that those are 45 degrees in the second quadrant and the third quadrant. I now have minus 1 over the square root of 2 or 2 over the square root of 2. Square root of 2 over 2, thank you. So I now have the square minus the square root of 2 over 2 plus and minus j square root of 2 over 2. So that this now ends up being what? That's now my second order, so my poles were here. This is now a second order high pass filter, and boom, you've got it. And if you needed to change that to have a different cutoff frequency, you know how to make that happen. You know how to move those poles by frequency scaling. Now, one more filter type to worry about. And so this high pass is proper, isn't it? It's no longer strictly proper. This is proper. What about a notch filter or a band reject? What does that magnitude response look like? Maybe it's here, flat, then it's down, there, there, and there. Very crude. But we can identify certain characteristics from this shape. What does this tell us on the high end? This tells us that this band reject is proper, a proper transfer function, which says that we the number of poles is equal to the number of zeros. What does this tell us? We don't have anything at the origin, do we? We have neither poles nor zeros at the origin. We actually have a bounded or a non-zero DC gain or a constant term. 
in the simplest case, what's going to give rise to this bending behavior beyond these two extreme conditions? You now know that you have at high frequencies, you're told that if I introduce poles, I have to introduce the same amount of zeros based on this high frequency behavior. And this is telling you that you don't have anything happening, poles or zeros, right at the origin. So that if you plugged in DC, you better get a number into your transfer function. What does this tell you right here? Is that a pole or a zero? That's a pole because you're sloping down after being flat. What does this now tell you? There's a zero. What's this tell you? Again, we're changing the slope in a positive way, and that's zeros are upstairs, they're going up. And what does this tell us? In the simplest case for a bandpass filter, then we could say that we have something, let's say band reject is now an S plus Z1 and an S plus Z2, S plus P1 and an S plus P sub 2, and maybe a gamma 1. And what's gamma 1 going to do? That'll just adjust our gain, isn't it? And what's gain adjustment do for us relative to that sketch? If I said increase the gain by 20 dB, now you just shift it up, don't you? So if you got lazy, you could just erase the scaling on your vertical axis and adjust it by 20 dB every place. And you wouldn't have to erase that entire curve, and that would be legitimate. You just shifted your curve up by 20 dB. Questions on filters. Now you know what the difference is, I hope, between strictly proper and proper. What that corresponds to in terms of high frequency behavior. Now to get us ready for the next set of material, and I'm going to run out of room because the machine wasn't working properly, was it? I don't think I did anything. I don't know. I need to figure out what's happening because that's getting frustrating. But what's the sinusoidal steady state output if x of t equaling 4 cosine of t minus 45 degrees plus 3 cosine of 4t and the system that you're applying that input to, H of S, has the following frequency response, where the following frequency response is right there. Now, is that clear enough? Can you see the frequencies and the scaling on the vertical side? What's important here? You had an x of t that was something. It was 4. Now I'm cheating. You'll have to commit this to memory, huh? Was this t minus 45 degrees? And the other one was 3 cosine of 4t. What's important to this discussion relative to this figure? Now if somebody tells you how your system behaves, one way of reporting that is to give you the frequency response. You now know how your system is going to respond to each and every frequency. And now you know what frequencies you have available to pass through that system. This might be a communication signal, or it may be a control system, and this is what you're trying to maybe regulate for, and this is just noise. And now your system behaves like this frequency response. What's important to this picture? 
What are you going to be keying on? Relative to this x of t and that, frequ and that frequency response. What are the two th things in x that you want to think about? You may not need the relative frequencies as much as you want the frequencies, right? So you want a frequency of 1, which is 10 to the 0, and you need a frequency of 4. So now you're interested in the phase at those frequencies and the magnitude or gain at those frequencies, where this one is minus 3 dB, possibly, so you know you're going to scale this first term by 1 over the square root of 2. And you're going to change its angle by 45 degrees. The next one, you are going to attenuate more. It's going to be down about minus 13. And its phase, or angle, is not going to be quite minus 90, but it's getting close to maybe minus 75, 70, maybe 80, somewhere in there. And that's how this will get filtered. You may have to convert these dB magnitudes into absolute or linear values, but that's doable from their dB value. And we'll pick up with this, which is giving us the Fourier series idea as far as it's very important to be able to represent periodic signals as sums of sinusoids. And once we have that, we can do anything we want with a given system. We'll pick up at that point on Thursday.